You're listening to the Straight to Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Welcome along to a brand new Straight to Video Podcast. I hope everyone is doing great out there. On today's show, I had a really interesting chat with Jay Aston, frontman and founder of the band Gene Loves Jezebel. Jay and the band have been around since the early 80s with some big MTV era hits, but it wasn't until maybe towards the end of the 1990s, I think, when they finally landed on my radar. I was playing bass in the band Courtesan and our singer John asked if I'd heard of them. The band looked so damn cool and the music occasionally drifted into the hook-laden rock I was all about with tracks like Motion of Love and the low-slung swagger of Jealous. So I was shocked that I'd not come across them before that point. I think I would have bought an album on how great they looked alone, never mind how cool their songs were. And even after deep diving into the band, I'm surprised they never get the love from the hard rock or glam rock crowds, which seem to show so much devotion to bands not half as good as Gene Loves Jezebel. This band have quite a turbulent history, which now sees two versions out on the road, much like the ongoing LA Guns saga, but Jay's version, Jay Aston's Gene Loves Jezebel, will be out next year celebrating 40 years with shows all over the UK. The band features longtime member James Stevenson on guitar, who many of you will know from The Alarm and a previous guest on this show, so that was cool to chat with Jay about and get his memories of when James came to the USA back in the 80s to help save the band's debut US tour. Before diving in, want to give a shout out to Dead Skull Coffee for supporting the show by offering you guys 15% off any order from their website, deadskullcoffee.co.uk. Simply fill your shopping cart and enter the discount code STV on checkout to grab that discount. And if you enjoy regularly listening to these chats, why not become a patron of the show, which in return for a very small monthly amount, starting at just £2.50, you get early access to guests, a bonus podcast, and also exclusive merch not available anywhere else. All the info can be found at patreon.com forward slash stvpod, and I appreciate you checking it out. I spoke to Jay just as he was about to play some intimate solo acoustic shows organised by the wonderful Moochin' About record label and I loved hearing all his stories, particularly about his time in the USA during the late 80s which must have been an incredible mind-blowing time for the band. If you'd like to find out more about the band then please visit genelovesjezebel.co.uk where you can find all the upcoming tour dates and there's some really interesting blogs up there, great old school photos and some cool looking promotional items which I always get a kick out of seeing. But in the meantime, I hope you enjoy this chat as we get into my straight to video talk with Gene Loves Jezebel's Jay Aston. <laughs> You got me now at last, great. So you're the first Zoom call I've ever done. All righty. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Awesome. Jay, how you doing, man? Good, man. Where are you? I am right in between Nottingham and Derby. Smack bang yeah. in the Midlands. Cool. <laughs> But I appreciate you dropping on this super fast. No, no, thanks for asking us, man. It's cool. I've had both James Stevenson and Smiley from The Alarm on the podcast. Oh, yeah. I just saw them. We just did a gig in Belgium. Yeah, I mean, obviously your relationship with James goes right back to your first tours in the US with Gene Loves Jezebel. But how far back does your friendship with Mike Peters and The Alarm go? Obviously both from Wales and formed around the same time. But did you cross paths back in the day? We crossed paths. He's North Wales. Obviously I'm South Wales, which is like, Two different countries really as far as networks go you know because you're more likely to come through manchester and all liverpool that area to where mike was whereas we were much more direct the west country in london you know so um yeah i bumped into him in, in london many years ago just said hi that was about it really and uh, i always noticed they were plagues we're kind of contemporaries yeah we're both very busy 82 83 84 and 85 86 87 88 you're suddenly part of that kind of big machine and just on a roll then he was yeah 
was at the States a lot and we were working in Europe a lot and then vice versa. So, um, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, and then stuff happened with us with our label going down Savage Records. And I wanted to do work on some solo stuff. And so James had nothing to do and Mike got hold of him, you know, and then that, that started their relationship. James probably knows the details better than I do, obviously. <laughs> but that's recollection of, of how it went. You know, I was living in LA, do my thing. And uh, James was in London, obviously. As always, the music thing is very incestual. Everybody crossed paths at some point. If it's okay, I want to talk a little about your early days of the band, but and I'd love to chat about some of your experiences in the USA, but also just to give people a bit of a backstory to where your journey began. You're from quite a large family back in Wales with like several older brothers, right? Yeah, yeah. There's eight kids, you know, wow. in my family. Seven boys, one girl. Big Catholic family. Outsider from the start, really, aren't you? How was that whole dynamic back then? Was the older siblings a big influence on you? Do you know how they felt when twin brothers came along? Has that ever been brought up? Like, who are these? <laughs> There's like the family split into two. I mean, I get on with them all pretty much apart from my twin. But uh, yeah, it's like the, there's the top four hanging out together and the bottom four, which is me, my brother and my sister and my, my little brother. So and they were kind of, a, and there was a little, there's a big gap between, say, my brother Edward, who's, who's like four years older than I was and six years and eight years for the other two, you know. And Richard's only two years, but there was a, enough of a gap where they're almost a different generation. But uh, I got to le- hear all my early influences from them, you know, all the music they bought is what I heard as as a kid so you know I, I'd hear the Beatles and the Stones and, and the usual stuff you know and I went, you know, I went to Catholic school which is about seven miles away in Aberavon because we're in kind of rural area where we were brought up my parents did own their own house but it was fairly cramped you can imagine with 10 people in it I bet how many bedrooms did you have was you like sharing bedrooms yeah we used to share bedrooms yeah my sister had her own bedroom my parents had their own bedroom but the rest of us shared but uh, there's such a big gap. My older brother, I mean, by the time, you know, we were grown up, he was got flown and then the second one too. So there was that kind of thing happening. But there was definitely a period, obviously, in the in the, in the 60s uh, when we were all cramped in there. You know? Yeah, wow. Then we went to school in uh, a Catholic school because my grandmother was uh, Catholic. So, you know, we were forced to go to a Catholic school. Now, Bravo, which is pretty violent and very you know, heavily um, congested area, you know, there's a lot of people live there, a lot of industry there, and it was a violent town, so a lot of violence. Did your brothers look out for you? No, not at all. They did not ever cope with their own things. As You you learn as you get older, you wonder, why why did they stick up for me? I used to have to stick up for myself, you know. I used to come back black and blue, you know, as you do, you know, fighting with someone every day. But, um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. You look back and I, I'd rather not have gone there. I'd rather have gone to my local comprehensive in Kenfick Hill. So I could have been mixing with the kids I actually hung around with, you know, I suppose. Because you're an outsider being a Catholic in your own village and then you're an outsider because you're not from that area when you went there. And lots of people have similar stories, I'm sure. But the cool thing was my older brothers, they were kind of more the hippie generation. So, I mean, that juxtaposition between the violence of the skinhead generation and you put that against, you know, the Johnny Mitchells and the, all the middle class kind of girls they used to pull, you know. So my heart naturally fell into Leonard Cohen and Dylan and, and all that kind of stuff. And then the Beach Boys, you know, classic Beach Boys stuff. Um, you mentioned um, the Beatles just a second ago. Didn't you recall seeing the Beatles on the Royal Variety performance? Absolutely. My, well, we didn't see the whole thing. My, my mum turned over. Your mum turned over? <laughs> well, because there was obviously such a, a massive build up to that whole thing. I, I, I do recall being on the front of the newspaper that, oh my goodness, the first single has not reached number one. It's like, can you imagine your first single being on the front page of the Daily Mirror and them saying, oh my God, what a disappointment. They're a failure. They're gone. They failed, you know. And so, you know, your perception of it was there was probably got 10 singles released every month or something. <laughs> of course, we know it's not at all like that. But yeah, I mean, the Beatles, they were played so much on the radio and just prior to Radio 1 and stuff, you know, I'm going back way back to being very young. And you knew every word to all the songs. That's how much they were played. Even now, it's like in the public consciousness still yeah, to this day. Everyone knows every single word. And I don't know. I mean, I've got the Beatles on Spotify and all the rest of it these days, of course, but when I left school, I went hitching, you know, I just sold all my records and uh, I travel light and I'm still the same. I like to travel light. The most I like to have is a, a guitar in my hand, you know, that's about it, really. That's all I like to travel with, you know, some shampoo and a guitar. That's all you need. <laughs> Maybe not even the shampoo. <laughs> <laughs> How would you hear about new music or begin to find your own identity through it? Was there any particular styles you were drawn to? Because I know Mark Bolan and T-Rex had a big impact on you. Who else was there along the way as you were growing up? My sister was really into um, T-Rex. So I, when she wasn't around, I'd be listening to her records. You, know? you couldn't say you liked T-Rex, but obviously you look back now, you can see Jimmy Page and people like that just nicked off Mark Bolan totally. You know? 
because there's so many of us, and I was a twin as well, identity is always a big thing for all of us, especially when we grow up. Who the hell am I, you know? But uh, I used to go into my own little shell, and I, I, I could sing from a very young age, and I was picked out in school for being able to sing, a same as when I could paint and draw as well. It was weird, which caused a lot of jealousy and quite difficult for me in some ways in my school, because the other kids didn't like it, obviously. So I didn't join the choir, as, as they asked me to, but I, I could sing. At this time of year, especially, I didn't have much money coming in, so I could go carol singing. And you get these old ladies, they're probably like in their 30s, to me, they seem really old at the time. And they just stand there and listen to me sing two or three Christmas carols. Yeah, I mean, I just lived in my own shell, really. I, I, I was captain of my football team for a little while. And then as soon as I got into music, football was silly. It seemed really silly to me. Now, I'm a big Spurs supporter, but only because of the tribal thing. I was a Spurs supporter as a kid, and I ran into some Arsenal supporters who were pretty obnoxious people generally. I've got some Arsenal friends, but they can be pretty obnoxious. So that just regenerated all the uh, all those cells that put in my bones, you know. But generally, I mean, football is a silly thing to get too worried about, but we do. But uh, we shouldn't really, because they're just multi-millionaires we're watching. We've got no control of saying any of it. And they don't give a damn who they play for. Was there any, like, cool record shops in South Wales for you to visit? There was a shop in Pithcore, which is three miles away. So a quick bus ride, or we'd walk, or even hitchhike. I used to hitchhike from at least eight years old, maybe younger, which was crazy when you think about it, right? But yeah, Pithcore, we'd go in there, and record stores. I mean, as we all know, beautiful places. Just like libraries, you can get lost in them, you know, looking through the albums. Just pick them up. How many times do you pick stuff up because you like the cover? Many times, you know. I said my school was very violent, but one of the great things, you made a lot of friends because of music. Suddenly someone would bring an album and you go, and you go, ah, oh. you know, and then you just talk about the music and then you realize there was another world out there. And a lot of these artists made you, you know, hear of a poets and artists you'd never heard of before. Or, so it is, uh, music was so important to us, wasn't it, as part of youth culture. And that we meet people from different towns and you follow bands, go and see them. Real events, which obviously that doesn't happen anymore, which is really unfortunate because it was so important, to, you know, if someone crass were coming through or anyone was coming, name any band you like, you know, and it would be a way of meeting people who felt the same as you. What opportunities did you get to see bands live? Well, loads of bands came through Swansea, Cardiff always. Everyone came to Cardiff. I, I nicked merchandise from them all. <laughs> Amazing. So, uh, you know, they all, they all came through. The Cardiff Capital was a great gig. I, mean, I saw everybody. I saw Queen there, or Bebop Deluxe. I've seen everybody. I've seen Led Zeppelin, The Who. I've seen all, all of them in their prime, you know. I've seen all those bands. And I, I can tell you what's wrong with them, what's right with every one of them, you know. They're all fucking human, I tell you that. None of them are gods. Which was the first one you nicked merchandise from then? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I should tell you this kind of stuff, but because uh, I was just a kid, 16, whatever, 17, they probably wouldn't have even done it. But it was pretty easy to do, you know, just grab a stack and off went running. You looked like one long head, spotty little herbert like everybody else. So they could never see who you were. Just run into the crowd. But I remember going to the ranking car. If I think I went to see, who was it? Was it the Bud's Cox? It was that first wave of punk, you know, and ordering about 15 drinks and one final drink. I said, I'll have a Bacardi and Coke, please. And when the young lady or the waitress went to get the Bacardi in court, I was gone. You know, so that was commonly done. I used to do that two or three times a night. You looked the same to them, you know? Incredible. I'm not going to tell you the bands I did, but I did make a fair profit. <laughs> My karma is bad. Was there a point when you wanted to take things further and get a guitar and begin writing songs? Was that always a logical step for you? I was going to be a singer. There was nothing or nobody that I came across that could sing better than me. Great self-confidence in the way I looked. For God knows why, because I'm not that good looking, but I thought I was. I think that's part of the trick, though. Not the trick, but it's having that confidence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you've got something and you're confident, then you've got everything. Guitar while playing, why is it a different game altogether? It's been hard work, guitar, for me. I mean, I've been guitarists I've had in the band, because I've only ever been in Chino Jezebel, you know. I've had Ian and uh, James, and Ian started playing guitars about six months before he joined the band, and he could play guitar, you know. James, similar sort of story. Some people just naturally, I've had to work hard. It's just a tool for you to write songs on, really. That's the way you approach it. A great tool, and I learned that all the best songwriters from the Bowies to the Dylans, etc. They can't really play guitar, but they can write songs. Because you learn it, you literally have to do just one note, one chord, and you can write a song from one chord, you know. And then you you can obviously expand on it when you learn a bit more about music. But if you have guitarists like James Stevenson, who can uh, expand on it immediately, or Pete Rizzo plays bass with us, you know. And the thing with Ian Hudson with the band, we used to bounce off each other a lot, but I could play him a riff or something, and he could instantly play it again. Whereas I'd have to go, I, I don't want to do that again. I want to sing, you know. But I, I learned a long time ago that I, my value was that people really needed me, you know, to write songs because they did, couldn't write songs. Having something to say is the most important thing. And that could be as simple as I love you or please don't smoke in my face or whatever people get upset about or politics. 
I had a girlfriend that got me into Bob Dylan when I was younger, and that's when I realised what a great writer he was. And she had a live album with all his lyrics on it. I could play a couple of chords, and I'd have something to say, and I'd write, write all little songs, which is just still quite good songs, I think. But you'd put his lyrics in front of you, and you'd put any chords behind it, and just read through them, and, you know, it's like a guilty undertaker cry, is it? Or it's just like, straight away, you go, wow you know, flowing at you and it takes people a while to get it sometimes. But, you know, when you get it, you know, he's, I mean, we played with him as well. You know, we actually, he actually opened for us one night because he wanted to get off to the next gig early. So he asked us to go and have to him. It was quite weird. Did you get much chance to interact with him? Oh, not really. He was, it's, it was when he was doing his never ending world tour thing back in the you know eighties and late eighties, early nineties, where he just kept on touring and touring and touring. And he'd literally just sit there in a hoodie backstage, you know, mumble through the songs. And he wouldn't know what song it was. I went to see him recently with a friend of mine in, in New York. And it was bizarre because, I mean, he's God to the, the most zealous of his fans and uh it was to me it was there was one or two moments that oh yeah that's bob dylan but the rest of it i thought oh, god why am I, what am i doing here you know but to them it was high art so what do i know you mentioned you'd been hitchhiking was that traveling around europe on occasion we'd hitch up well we hitched up to london quite a lot me and my best friend john weatherstone sometimes my other friend steve day was too because he'd be more into the more new wave stuff so i go with him i remember we, we hitched up to go and see the clash once but uh we couldn't get past how did we get stuck? We got stuck somewhere. I can't remember where. Siren Sester or something like that. You know? And uh, we just stayed there. I got drunk there for the weekend. <laughs> but I always had that wandering spirit. I always remember being very young. I'm looking at my school when you can see the trains go by. And I still love trains. I've just been touring now with um, dead men walking. And, and I've been traveling on my own on the train. But yeah, I used to hitch ever. I hitched to Morocco. I hitched around Europe. In... I've never hitched in the USA. But I've I have hitched... In the UK, about seven or eight years ago, I got stuck somewhere. I was offered a gig to open for Fanny and Cannibals, weirdly, just acoustically. And then just literally two days before they start the tour, there was no hotels so on a Saturday night in the UK. Try to get an hotel. Everyone's getting married and all that kind of stuff. So I had hitchhiked out of town to get a place on the motorway. But with hitching, you meet all kinds of people. I got to say, bring some stories back from that. You do. I met a Morris dancer. And I was hitching to go, uh, I can't watch where I was going. He says, you're going the wrong way. And a lot of people would pick you up because you remind them of their son or something. You know, that's what I used to find. A worried mother would go, oh, you can't be a chicken. <laughs> so they pick you up. I met tons of people. Yeah, oh, nothing, nothing negative, I'm, I'm glad to say. You came back from that and I think you said you had the plan to put the band together and try and take things to the next level. Was there any opportunities to perform around where you were from or was it always the goal to take things to London? I hitched to Austria and Germany and places like that. And I was thinking, I was thinking, oh, I should maybe form a band here, you know. But then I raised, the, the, everything was happening in England with television and all that stuff was exploding, you know, talking heads and bands I really like. And so I thought, I better go back to Wales. And I just formulated a plan in my head. You know, I guess you call it creative visualisation. Some of the free new world thinkers would say, I, but that's exactly what I was doing. But I, in my head, so I'll go back to Wales, I'll form a band, I'll write the songs, maybe use a drum machine or whatever. And then we'll go up to London. I hustle a gig at the Institute of Contemporary Art because that was the only gig that seemed to give outside bands some some sort of focus on, on their rock week, if you're unheard of. In Wales, there wasn't, you literally had to buy a PA to do gigs pretty much in Wales in that era. So we did get a small PA and we did do a couple of little things. But we were aware that, you know, Paul Morley wasn't going to come down to see us in the Knight's Arms in Puff Court. Did you have the whole image and everything back then as well when you first started? I'm just wondering how that went down in South Wales. <laughs> well, you know, I used to get, I used to, well, I'm a skinny thing with a very macho rugby culture, as you can imagine. And even the soccer boys too had more problems with them, really. They didn't like it. Their girlfriends all liked us. So you can imagine that was... That's the thing that winds them up, I think, more than anything. We'd be skinny and drain pipe trousers, you know, all made, you know, by girlfriends and stuff. And um, yeah, I mean, I had very long hair. Then I cut it all off because of uh, the punk thing, which is incredibly liberating, you know, at the time. It was risky and all people who identified with us would follow us around quickly, you know. But our early gigs, we had a gig with Crass, you know, which was brilliant in Barry and Poison Girls. Uh, I mentioned Poison Girls in one of my songs, you know. Um, the boys and girls are all here, you know, that's in always a flame. I quickly realised that we need to get to London. So I got everyone to go to London and not everyone would come. The drummer was still in college, wanted to finish his university stuff. The bass player wasn't technically a good enough musician. And they wanted me to play bass for a while and that'd be ludicrous. One, I'm not good enough. Two, uh, I'm a singer. So we came up to London. My brother had gone ahead of us and he'd met a couple of people. 
And uh, we formed a band. We formed a bass player in the ICA. He was projectionist. The Institute Contemporary Art. That didn't last long with him. Didn't you get Julianne Reagan to play bass at one point? Yeah, then I met Julianne. She saw one of the early gigs and she wrote a piece in zigzag about us. And I said to her, because it was very much do-it-yourself era still. And I said, why don't you uh, come on? I said, I got a bass. Why don't you come and play bass with us? And she did. And it just so happened she's very talented. You know, she's very musical. She's got an amazing year. The way she can hear harmonies and things is quite complex, you know, and quick. She just, uh, I will do a little song. She says, oh, I, I got an idea for that. And she'll send you something back a couple of hours later. And that summer would have taken me months to do, you know, just, just to think of the harmonies, you know. So she's an amazing talent, really. She has this pure, pure voice, you know. So it's ironic that I work with Jean-Marc Lieberman and Julianne now, and they were both early members of Gina's Jezebel. And yet we're not called Gina's Jezebel, we'll just call our own names. But uh, there's some sort of irony there. It's actually pure Gina's Jezebel. Did you cross paths with anyone else back then? Who else was causing a buzz? Was there any other bands coming up through the ranks? Oh, there's loads of bands coming up. When I first went to London, weird memories in my head. I remember seeing um, Nicky Finn from T-Rex in, in a pub, you know, just sitting there in the middle of the afternoon, which is quite surreal. Because <laughs> I'd seen his post with my, my sister for so many years, you know. But uh, bands back then, ah, uh, second, The Bunny Man, U2, uh, Delta 5, uh, Virgin Prince, all on the same bill. Do you have any favourite clubs or anything like that outside of venues? Was there any cool clubs which you enjoyed? We used to live in Pimlico for the longest time, you know, which is awesome. The venue was there, which was literally, you know, 10 minutes from where we lived. And apart from being from where the small faces were all based back in the day too, and Passport of Pimlico and films like that. It's a magical little area, it's a kind of hidden little triangle there. And the venue, I saw loads of bands there. And they're all bands would hang out what they call lig there. No matter where they played, then they'd end up in the venue in Victoria, you know. And it's a great loss, really. But I saw the Stray Cats, though. They were phenomenal. It's like you kind of take it for granted as well back then, as well, I suppose. Then when you look back on it, it's like, wow. I saw that birthday party there about 10 times, you know. So people like Chris Rea would be passing through or, you know, everyone played there. I saw Nico play there. We opened for Nico there. And they'd ask us, early Gina's Jazz would open for bands loads because we were so close. People, they didn't have a the support. They'd just say, because we had rough trade with our agent, you know, and they'd call up and say, oh, because I had a phone in the hall. It wasn't my phone, but I used that as my number. And I'd hear it ring and run out. And my kinks from rough trade would say, Jay, can you do, or J-A. My name wasn't Jay. My name's John Aston. It's J-A. And that got shortened. But uh, can you do tonight? Uh, Nico's playing tonight or birthday party playing tonight or someone's playing tonight. Can you come along? I'd say, yeah. <laughs> so I saw Kajigugu there. <laughs> Incredibly diverse time as well. It was. I mean, people forget that. People say the 80s and we have to put up with MTVs or VH1s or the BBC's view of what happened with goth and all those scenes. It was much more diverse than the Lale show, you know. It wasn't all fucking Madonna and all the rest of it. And there was far more going on than that. Very colourful time. And it was a time when you you weren't going to make it. You knew you weren't going to be on top of the pops because that was impossible. So that freed you, you know. it was very, It's a bit like today. You, there's nothing to aim for now for a young band. They're not going to make it, make any money out of it. So that frees you. You can do what the hell you like. <laughs> That was the feeling there. There was no money in it. You weren't going to make it. So you'd go to clubs and hang out with people and, and they'd be from all kinds of different, you know, Kid Creole and the Coconuts would be there, to Sade, to tons of people would just be hanging out all together. And it wouldn't be any, you know, there'd be artists and the young actors. And I think as soon as, what would I put it down to? I guess around the time Nirvana happened, suddenly everyone would just went into blocks. There was all the men, heavy metal crowd, metallicas, and, and all that was destroyed, you know. Suddenly it all became so boring, really, in my opinion. Do you um, recall much about the first opportunities to go to the USA? Was that ever on your radar? Never on our radar. We, we used to look down on the USA, we used to think they were full of morons. Reagan, you know, we thought he was a fucking wanker, an idiot. Uh, so that was a view of America. It wasn't very good. I've since learned it's fantastic, but at the time, uh, you know, what happened? We were supposed to be playing, what year was it? Was it 85? When the, was it Roma Liverpool, that final where the fans got crushed? I don't know the year, but I remember the event. Yeah. I remember being in Beggars because we're on Beggars, of course, in the fall and birthday party, a lot of bands on Beggars Bauhaus and a lot of cool hip bands. And I was remembering there one day and that Mark C. Smith was in there. Who else was in there? Other bands are supposed to just about to tour Europe, basically, Italy particularly and we were one of them 
and we're all waiting there, probably getting, trying to get some money out of the accountant or something, probably. And it was just so quiet everywhere. It's, it's bizarrely quiet in Wandsworth. That's where beggars is still there. Except they used to have one building, now they own a block you know, <laughs> or two. But it, it was so weird. I thought it was weird because I wanted to get some cigarettes or something. And normally it'd be traffic running about everywhere. It was just dead. I thought, this is really weird. And that's then we heard about the Heisel Stadium disaster, you know, where those fans got crushed. And then the, the, the label heard pretty much from the foreign office that it's not advisable for British bands to tour Italy because the feeling will be a retribution. So uh, fortunately, we we already done some record with John Cale in New York in a weird little trip we did for a few days. What was your impressions of New York? Oh my god! Because <laughs> I guess it has still had some of that grit back then. Oh my god! It was Jesus, fuck it up. We arrived in New York. We never even wanted to ever go there, yeah, but we, we arrived there. John Cale he wanted to record us, so we, that's why we, we flew over in it. And you couldn't go to a more extreme city than New York and all the US of all the cities to hit first, you know. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, it's all giant buildings, giant cars, everything's noisy, it's guns, it's crazy stuff happens, drugs everywhere, insane food, delis, exciting smoke coming from every manhole cover, 17 below, <laughs> degrees below, you know, MTV's just exploding this channel, you got Van Halen doing jump on it and all kinds of, it's just things going crazy, bands you'd never heard of, formed last week with suddenly saying a million records. It's all suddenly dumped on you all of a sudden, like, wow. All dumped, massive, this huge culture thing, and with toy money, and it was amazing. We, we arrived in here, we were poor, you know, at that time, so I was still signing on. So um, we <laughs> arrived there, and we were wearing, we're still in, do you know what daps are? It's a Welsh expression for um, canvas plimsolls, I guess. What do you call them? Just plimsolls in England? In England? We call them daps, you know, and they're basically a very poor man's, you know, garb. <laughs> so we get off the plane, all spiky topped hair and skinny things, you know, and in rags, get through and the guy at the desk was, oh yeah, I let Duran Duran through your last week. One of those kind of lines they used to say to you, whatever, you know, and come and welcome to New York, you know, in a very heavy, usually Brooklyn or New Jersey accent. It's actually JFK, so probably Queens. So we get off the plane and we're on the carousel and one of those, what do they call them? Those guys that pick up all your luggage. One of those comes up and he goes, oh, I want to pick your luggage. I'm like, oh, sure. And there was a guy from the rental truck company that came to pick us up with a van to take us into town, you know. And he lifts all our gear, the whole band and roadies, whatever, you know, puts on a thing. And, and then he takes the van, loads it onto the van. We'd never done any of this before. And we say to the driver, well, are we supposed to tip him? And by the way, it's freezing cold, snowing, 70 and below. And we're wearing daps, you know. And the guy, and he says, oh, a buck. And we thought, oh, we just give him a dollar. He made a buck a piece for every piece that he's put on. You give him a dollar, you know. We just give him a buck. He goes, fucking limeys. <laughs> I just walked off, you know. Welcome to New York. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was our first expensive jet flight. Like, first time I'd ever been on an airplane. It was Qatar Airways, which was an old fleet then. The war hadn't happened yet with Iraq, so they, they hadn't been bought a new fleet yet. So there's no alcohol on there. So that was a new one for us. It was packed and all the gangways were packed with um, people playing cards and gambling and things, which is quite bizarre. And smoking back then as well. Smoking. Sitting sit in the gangway, all four or five people from Qatar or the Middle East playing cards in the main gangways. <laughs> smoking, you know, quite bizarre. So the flights had to take forever. But, you know, we arrived there, got in, finally get to the uh, Iroquois Hotel, which is a very fancy hotel these days. There was other bands there, but it was really a filthy, disgusting, cockroach infested. But that's where I learned very early. I got a tip from someone with cockroaches, just leave the bathroom light on. They do not like that fluorescent light. So if you're ever in a room with cockroaches, just stick that light on. They will not bother you. You won't get them scuttling across your, your back when you're sleeping. Wow, that's a tip. I've learned something then. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's just been a traveller's tip I've given to people over the years and they told me about it. I said, well, next time you're in filthy cockroach infested hotel. I remember James saying when he stayed there before us, you know, uh, his brother walked in the room and a rat ran across the room. But now it's a very fancy hotel. But anyway, it was on, it was, on was it West 44th Street? I can't remember. It was 44th Street. You know, very huge skyscraper. It was very dark. They had one little centipede machine in, in a lobby, which I think I lived on. And you used to see everybody was passing, every musician was passing through because they, they, they'd stick us all in there, whether it was Motorhead or whoever was passing through, you know. But it was awesome. I met people on that trip that I'm still close to to this day. And it was a place called Dance Interior, which is a legendary club, which pretty much, you know, um, you were talking earlier about how people used to mix and match and ask them about London. Nothing compares to Dance Interior as far as a mix and match. It was several floors with elevators, you know, and 
when we were there, Madonna played there, you know, early on. We played two gigs there. And there's footage of us playing there, which I find unbelievable. It's the same as our first gig, the ICA. There's footage of that. I'm like, what the? So you don't even know there's cameras there. These days, of course, you see them everywhere. But then there was you'd have to carry a big video camera and hold it. And we never no- no noticed it. But it was um, fantastic, really exhausting in many ways. I did a lot of cocaine because I'd never even heard of that before. Arrived at the club, and I think I was wearing a black dress, long hair with tons of colours and pipe cleaners and stuff in my hair, and makeup, you know. And the women just went, bing, straight for me like that. And before night was, hello, hello. But it's not for me. It's not a joke that works for me. So I, did, I quickly didn't, that one didn't work for me. You learned that one fast. It's not my, it's not my kind of thing. But it was for a naive Welsh boy, you know, um, it was uh, exciting. And you'd return to do some live shows, um, which was, I believe it was originally planned as two gigs, but would become three and a half months. Yeah, well, good to back to what happened with the Heisler Stadium disaster. We'd met Ruth Polsky, who booked gigs in New York, you know, at Dancer Tier particularly. And there was a thing called Rock Week which was fairly new then, but it was a big thing. Uh, you know, a lot of bands came through that. For instance, the week, the year we were there, it was um, uh, Megadeth's first album came out. I always remember the the agent saying to me, oh yeah, we've got this band and the album's called uh, Killing Is My Business and Business Is Good, which we thought was hilarious. And no one had ever heard of them, apart from obviously the small band of thrash metal followers of those days, which would have been very small. But that was the era, it's just where all the agents met together, all the little record labels, you know, and all the little clubs, promoters, all to see who's coming out and what's happening. So my brother called up Ruth and says, oh, can you get us, you know, gig up for the upcoming the new music seminar, it was called. And she said, OK, I'll do you a favour. She liked, you know, my brother's charismatic and personable, can be. And she liked us. And so we got that gig. And from that one gig, turned out into many months of touring. Do you remember, like, was there, for it to turn into like that amount of time, was the label really getting behind the band or was there a particular song catching on the radio? Or was it just like, we need to get this band exposure and this is an opportunity for them to get out on the road and build a fan base that way? With us, I mean, we, we were never darlings of the press. Steve Southern liked us, Melody Maker, uh, and Julianne at Zigzag. <laughs> we didn't have too many friends in the press. They hated the fact we were makeup, they're all macho, they liked all you know all the macho stuff, even though we could have kicked anyone's fucking asses any day of the week, you know what I mean? But uh, they looked at us and thought we were just very fey and all the rest of it. Yeah, I have to be tough to look this good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He tried fucking with Jake Bird, you know what I mean? But there was a tipping point, I guess, when suddenly we were big in England. Our records were going to number one and number two in the indie charts. There was a, a real momentum starting to happen with us, you know, with the second album, which we were just about to be dropped by beggars when, when we finished that second album. The iconic picture on the front of Immigrant, which every goth says, oh, that's already got. That picture is an old picture. They would not pay for a, a new photo session. You know what I mean? So that was an old session. People thought, oh, so cutting edge. It was it was a year and a half old, which for that period of time was a long time, you know? Yeah. My hair had grown very long by the time that record came out. People come to see us and say, because I didn't look like that anymore, you know? We'd already sort of developed something in England and we were in Italy as well. We were going to Italy. There was They were excited about us there too. We were starting to get covers of magazines there and Japan. So we kind of broken through in spite of the enemy and in spite of these magazines ignoring us. We always thought because we were Welsh or something, they were racist, you know, they couldn't deal with it. And then we just kind of did our own thing, forged our own way, which is what identity is all about. And then really, we, all those bands from the 80s, people forget that you can put a, a lot of records on, you haven't got a clue who it is, but well, those 80s bands, you know who it is as soon as it comes on. Because identity was important to all the bands there. On that um, US tour, after just a couple of shows, your guitarist Ian Hudson would no longer be able to tour, which is where James Stevenson comes into the picture. How was you feeling about all that at the time? Was you panicking, thinking everything's just falling apart just as things are starting to happen? Oh, it was a disaster. I mean, the the thing was we could easily have just disintegrated, you know, because the guitar player is a pretty important part of the whole setup, you know. But my brother said a a very cool thing. He says, well, any band is better than no band at all. We just stick together and and just make it work. So we got through some gigs just about with Ian. I'd end up playing a lot of guitar, which I didn't like because suddenly I'd have to be stuck looking at my guitar shoegazing as opposed to projecting and being what I saw as Jezebel, you know, (laughs) the big, big character. We didn't know James. My brother had seen him play live. We'd said, oh, we'll get Steve New because I'd seen him and he looked great, long black hair. And I thought he'd be he'd be great. But James, my brother had seen him play with James through management when he was in London, you know. And so James was asked to come on the plane. And so and he met us. I think we were opening for Midnight Oil in New York. He told me that. He said you didn't even put him on the guest list. <laughs> <laughs> 
the, but, well, the last thing the band thinks about is stuff like that, number one. They blame the manager for it. He didn't blame you guys. He said, the manager forgot to put me on the guest list. I think that's pretty much sums up our management at the time, I would say. But anyway, we do meet him. He comes after the gig and, he, and he, we meet him and he doesn't look anything like us. He's got a white shirt on. He's got red hair. He's got a moustache. He's wearing blue jeans. I mean, we think this is not going to work. You know what I mean? There's no way this is going to work. But then a little bit of mascara and Kajal couldn't work out. Trimmed his eyebrows and we were rocking. <laughs> Great musician. And James picked it up really. I mean, it was a difficult gig. Fair play to him. You know? But uh, he's, I mean, that's why he's so popular. He's very well loved, James. He's the most liked person I know. He's a lovely guy. But if you want to do a job, he's professional. You will do it. You know, if you've got a, if the show depends on it, if Tony Visconti calls you up and you know, you know, you're pretty good or Pete Walsh or any of these great producers, they always, Jim's a, a guy they go to. So we were lucky, very lucky. What was America's reaction to the band at that time? Was it different all over the country in like the different pockets? Because that's a long time to be over there. You must have hit every part of America. We played cowboy bars to very hip university towns. Yeah. Just to the obviously LA, New York, Chicago, Detroit, which would have a cool epicenter, all of those kind of cities. It was fun, you know. Was, well, luckily, I've kept diaries of all these things, so I know everywhere we played and the kind of things that happened. But there's little things that come to mind. My, this is pre-internet and all the rest of it, obviously. So our information about yeah, the US was limited, you know. It's to Elvis Presley and Cadillacs, pretty much, and you know, and McDonald's. So I just remember going. We went into a diner one day. And all the stuff, they were all like makeup and like really gothed out. I thought, wow. And they just looked at us because every morning I'd freshen up, I'd shower and clean up, and I'd just walk in with long hair and some probably some dark glasses. But Marcus, for instance, and some of the members of the band, they probably they just rolled out of bed from the night before. They'd look exactly like they did the night before. So they looked pretty scary as well. The staff looked at us like terrified. And this was our introduction to what we all know now as Halloween, because it's a big thing over here as well these days. And uh, we thought, wow, there's goths in this town. But no, they were just dressed up. <laughs> and they were staffing in a diner on the road but it was just hilarious I remember Peter's laughing his head off no I think this is, this is what they do every other week so they thought they'd seen the devil Min. how was it arriving in Hollywood that first time I think you did two nights at the Roxy James told me yeah well Hol- yeah we had I think James Addiction on for us was it wow. a couple of times yeah they were kind of unknown then you know I, did, I didn't hang with them at all you know someone stole my mascara i don't know the fuck who can't remember the gig but someone stole my fucking mascara <laughs> same thing it might have been them you know what i mean so uh, they wear whatever's current those guys you know they'd just jump on any bandwagon those fuckers so yeah i mean hollywood took to us really really straight away you know it was quite weird we were like on covers of their little magazines and everything really quickly did you like it out there i'd grown to like it i didn't not at first i didn't no the hot sun on pale skin wasn't ideal and plus the drugs i mean new york and i mean america the, the drugs i mean it's probably the same ever in the world now but then it was it was mind-blowing the, the amount of heavy drugs that people were, were doing openly you know but you know so many beautiful women used to just chase us and we were idolized you know Southern California is where we sold most of our records. I mean, out of a, it was a huge market. They took to us straight away. I mean, the LA Times wrote a piece of us from the mouths of babes. You know, we, we just fitted straight into what their dream was, you know. So, yeah, they embraced us really quickly. It was almost like a, I guess, in hindsight, it's almost like a perfect storm, really, because around that time in, like, the late 80s, all the rock was turned quite... I mean, I'm a massive fan of all, like, the hair metal, the bubblegum pop rock, which was there, but... You had the image which there was loving of that, but you still you had that edge as well. We came from left field, obviously, but we still, as I always said to people, well, we play struts and Les Pauls. <laughs> yeah, so you know what I mean? So we weren't just flock of seagulls <laughs> playing with one finger on a keyboard, you know, and good luck to all those bands and not knocking any whatever they've done, they've all did what they had to do and it was cool for them, you know. But uh, we believed in, you know, four-piece rock and roll band, really. Unfortunately, we got pulled too much that way for the, our liking. Gethin and I were pushing us too much over that way when, you know, a, a large part of our audience loved our uh, eccentricities. I mean, one of the ironies of, I mean, what's his name from, from Kerrang? Dixon, was it? We're a writer for Kerrang anyway. He embraced us early on, and this is when we were still pretty much far more left than into the rock field, you know. And uh, the reason he liked us was because of Stephen, which is a lot of the time I'd let my brother do the lead vocals because we had to technically he'd be the lead singer, even though he wasn't singing and all the stuff. Uh, and so I'd have the B-sides and I'd do Gorgeous. And one of the songs I did was, was Stephen. And he just loved it, as did um, 
the guitar player from Blur, one of his most influential. Wow. And as Lady Gaga, loads of people. It's just been a major influence on people. And this was my struggle within the band, always fighting someone I felt couldn't sing or write, which is my brother, in my opinion, and he'd have a different opinion on it. But he was totally in my way all the time, you know. And uh, so I, when he wasn't around, it's great. Oh, great, that's fantastic. I'll do these songs. I don't know how much of this you're familiar with, but you had your song Desire featured on the soundtrack to the John Hughes movie She's Having a Baby in 1988. Right. John Hughes was a genius at putting together such incredible soundtracks and he he's was. featured bands like Flesh for Lulu, Dream Academy. Do you recall much about that or was that kind of in the hands of record labels and publishers? He wanted to use, I think he wanted to use it for the film before and I didn't like the script idea. Well, they told me the story, but I can't remember what the story was. What was it? Some Kind of Wonderful? Might have been that one. I didn't like the story when I read of it anyway. Then the next one came out, and I think Vegas said to me, oh, what about this one? I mean, I'm <laughs> so pretentious, man. I don't care about money. That's why I'm broke. <laughs> so, but uh, and I, I just liked the story better, you know? And, and there was a good soundtrack. There's Kate Bush was on it. There's some really good songs on it, you know? And so I said, yeah, that, that's a good scene, having the bathroom. Yeah, cool. So that's why I said, yeah, <laughs> to that one. Are you a movie fan? Do you like a lot of movies? The joy of my life is very simple. I like music and I like hiking and walking. That's my biggest joys in life. So anything that gets in the way of those two things, even though other things I enjoy doing, like video games and that, I could spend my life on it, but I don't play them at all because life is so short, you know. Not as good as Centipede back in the day. Well, exactly. Well, you know, I used to do a lot of things back in the day, as they say. <laughs> I look back upon it and say, what an idiot. I mean, how can you not love a great movie? And the great movies, by definition, is it's great for a reason, right? So, but the last great thing I've seen, you know, which I, you know, because as I say, I'm very, you have to literally pin my feet to the floor to watch something, was Breaking Bad. And there was obviously a lot of fuss about it. I didn't know anything about it, but I'd seen Anthony Hopkins, who's, as you know, a phenomenal actor and from my neck of the woods, uh, someone I look up, look up to, said that he thought that Brian Cranston, yeah, yeah, he said he's the greatest actor he's ever seen, you know, and Shakespearean and a, I thought, oh, my God. Well, so I said to my friend in L.A., who I stay with, I said, oh, well, why don't we just watch the pilot and just see how it goes, you know? And we watched the pilot and both of us at the end of it, jaws dropped. It was like, oh, my God, that is the greatest thing I've ever seen. And then I was hooked on it. So, you know, I've spent many, many, many hours tuning through it and... You know, it's great. I talked to my sister about it. I never thought she'd be into it. So you meet loads of people you wouldn't expect to be into it. Because as you know, it's, it's such a great series. You don't, uh, when people say they, they've seen it, you have to find out where they are and you never want to spoil it. And the follow up, Better Call Saul, I, I like it even more weird enough. Even though it started slow for me and it's very different pace. Now I'm into it. It's like, wow, I can't. And I know he's just had a heart attack, hasn't he? Yeah, I saw him recently in LA. They often get up in these little clubs and just perform, you know, and he's really funny. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to the, probably the last series of Better Call Saul. And the last film I saw would have been the one of the last film. I mean, it took me a long time to see Fargo. People said, oh, Fargo's a good movie. I just thought it was one of those road movies about traveling through, you know, the Midwest. And I thought, I can't be bothered watching that. Then I find this saw and I was like, oh my God, it's amazing, you know. All them Coen Brothers films are great. Yeah, a lot. I like a lot of their films. No Country for Old Men. I mean, that's terrifying, isn't it? What's the one with Lewin Davis in it? The one, the, the folk singer one. It's it's the one that's based in the 60s, just pre Dylan. And you have to be a fan of that era, which I'm a huge fan of that era of music. That's my kind of my favorite kind of era of music, really, like the early 60s, mid 60s, because there's so much songwriting involved, you know. If you're into that era of music, it's a brilliant film. But if you're not, I wouldn't recommend it because it gets under the skin of that era beautifully. Uh, what's, it, what's it called? Remembering Clue or something? I can't remember. I'll have a quick look. Technology, eh? I remember being in a car park in LA with Tower Records. I used to live up on Larrabee Street at the top there, you know, which is just off Sunset Boulevard, just up from the Viper Room. You go up the hill. Tower Records was at the bottom. The little famous Tower Records. The there. famous Tower Records. And I remember, because, you know, back in the day, I thought I'd just pop down to Tower Records and pick up something I'd heard, you know. And a friend of mine, Suzanne, came to visit me and she came out of the car, knocked my front door, parked in my little car parking lot just in the front. And it's about, oh, far is it? 50 foot to my front door. And she goes, oh, i got to hear this new band. And I said, no, I haven't heard them. Oh, let me go and get the CD. It's in my boot, you know. 
And I said to her, I bet you I can download that. This is back before downloading and become big. I said, I said, I bet you I can download that song, which I've never heard of the band before, before you get from your trunk, as they call it, to my front door. Was this Napster days? This is uh, just Napster. Yeah, yeah. She could not believe it. As she came through the door, through my speakers, was coming this band. I'd never heard of it. She just mentioned the title and I got it. And I used to just, you know, think, oh, I just popped down to Tower. And no wonder that they went bust very quickly after that, unfortunately. Did you ever do any in stores at Tower Records? It, we still all the record in the one in of Broadway in New York for the most people that ever came to an in-store. Really? Yeah, that's why my name got shortened to J because I got tired of kids asking me what does J-A stand for? I'd say it's just J. What's J-A stand for? Oh, it's John Aston. They just kids call me J-A. And then I do that 3,000 fucking times and you go, no, it's Jay. No, it's just Jay. Did you have to turn people away at that in-store or did you stick it out right till the end? Oh, I think we used to spend hours there. You know, we didn't have good management, so we probably stuck out to the end. <laughs> We'd be fucking exhausted, you know. It's really exhausting. They were fun in some ways, but they, three hours later, you, it's, it's you're tired. And the people just coming through round and round. So, you know, we never signed up for that kind of thing. You know, that wasn't our idea of where we were going in life. You know, so it was all a bit of a shock to us, really. Just kind of in closing, Jay, you'll be celebrating 40 years of Jean Loves Jezebel with a tour next year, which has been rescheduled a couple of times because of everything that's been going off. You've mentioned a few, but are there any other bands or musicians over the course of your career who have surprised you or you've been flattered that by hearing your songs have been an influence on them? I know Billy Corgan of Smashing Pumpkins has been a supporter of the band. Yeah, Billy's come a couple of times. That was a shock, yeah. Uh, as I said, Lady Gaga. And, I mean, Sparks guys, they mentioned this early on, uh, Aerosmith. But they might have been just saying in passing because we were hip at the time, who knows. Because I guess you'd have kind of been label mates with Aerosmith, wouldn't you, around the late 80s? We were. I think my brother bumped into him a couple of times. I never actually bumped into them. But um, who else would I think of? No, I can't think of people off my head. I don't really care if people like this or not, really. <laughs> just music, man, you know. What are you looking forward to about getting out on the tour? Is it, It's going to be a long time coming. We just did Belgium, the Sinners Day Festival. Festival on the 1st of November and this month has been really busy for me it was just amazing you know just to jump on that stage and all the energy we have you know and as if nothing had happened it was surreal really it's all a crazy dream it's like Dallas back in the day turn up in the shower <laughs> exactly it's exactly like what what happened you know hey Barbie <laughs> it was amazing so yeah I do I mean it's, it's always very easy for me with the band because they're such good musicians and you know I can just concentrate on singing really and I got so much energy just screaming to get out of my bones you know i just love it i mean I, I walk 15 20 miles most days i just have to get out there and do stuff but if i'm on stage i can burn up a lot of energy in that hour and a half however long we're on stage you know smiley said to me jay this is like a ballad you shouldn't be dancing so much and i said no it's just what i want to do man <laughs> jay thank you ever so much for chatting with me i look forward to um, seeing the band on tour next year cheers rob let me told you man Many thanks to Jay Aston of Gene Loves Jezebel for being so open and honest about the band and his adventures over the years. I had a great time talking to him and I hope it was fun to listen to. Be sure to visit genelovesjezebel.co.uk to find out where the band will be playing next year in the UK and for all the up-to-date news on new music. For everything straight to video, you can find it at stvpod.com with close to 150 episodes of this show, along with STV music, videos and merch. And if you could, please consider sharing one of your favourite episodes to whoever you think might enjoy it. And like, subscribe or follow on your favourite podcast platform so you don't miss a single episode. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for listening and for the continued support of this show and I look forward to chatting again real soon.